Hey, good morning and welcome to church today. I am Pastor Ian and I lead the worship here at Muncie First Church. This is your weekly two minutes of news. I wanna thank you for taking time to be here with us or for those of you who are tuning in online, that is such a blessing to us. Here are a few things that we want you to know about. If this is your first time here, we are so glad that you have joined us and we would encourage you to go to MuncieFirstChurch.com forward slash new here so you can learn more about us. You can also follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube page. That's a great place to uh, check up on the sermon archive, watch an old service, or just keep up to date with what's going on in our community group and our small groups and other announcements. For those of you that, that join us regularly online, we are currently only live streaming to Facebook. Stick with us, we are working hard to get the YouTube live stream back up and running. It is a, an equipment issue that we're currently working through. So just please be patient. We are hoping to, in the future, continue to live stream both to Facebook and YouTube. If you have kids, we would love for them to join us in our kids' ministry following the music. Muncie First Kids is a great opportunity for your children to connect and learn about faith, love, and Jesus on their level in an environment that is created specifically for them. Muncie First Church students, 6th to 12th grade, are invited to join us on Sunday night at 6 p.m. for our student ministry. We are working hard to create a safe and fun environment where your student can develop a growing relationship with Jesus and each other. As always, if you would like to participate in the ministry of Muncie First Church, know that you can do so in several ways. We are currently looking for team members to join the following volunteer teams. Sound techs, media and lighting tech, we need nursery workers, we need guest services, greeters, children's ministry workers, and small group leaders. These are all important positions, and we hope that you will consider joining us uh, in service. Again, thank you for taking time to join us today. We hope that you have a great day. We hope that the service is great. We've worked hard to prepare the service and make it special. So please join with us this morning as we sing, as we get into God's word. I, my hope is, is that you will be uh, already praying and looking forward to a move of God this morning as we gather together. Have a great day. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? I can't hear you. Sorry. It's the, it's a really weird thing. To, I feel like I have my ears plugged. So it's like when I ask something and try to hear you, I, I can't hear you. So I just, you have to be really loud. How are we doing this morning? Okay, that's better. I can hear you now. Now, well, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. We want to welcome you to Muncie First Church and welcome those of you who are here with us in the room. Uh, we are thankful for your presence and, and just the blessing that it is to get to see faces. Um, it, it's, it's crazy to think about how much we miss out when we don't see each other's face or don't get to actually interact in, in, at times with each other. Um, we miss that and maybe don't even realize it. But we're so thankful for you and thankful for those of you who are tuning in online as well. We hope that this morning, uh, as the video said, is truly a blessing. And so let's stand together and we'll begin uh, before we start singing with a word of prayer. Just invite God's presence to meet with us this morning. Jesus, we are so, <coughs> God, we are thankful for you. We're thankful for your desire to have a relationship with us, God, and we're thankful that you uh, care about us, God, and, and you know what's going on in our lives. There are many people here this morning and maybe tuning in online or that will watch this service later on in the weeks to come, God, that have different things going on in their life, and maybe they're going through a good season or maybe they're going through a difficult season. I pray that this morning they would be able to just surrender totally to you, God, that they would turn everything over to you, lay it at your feet this morning, and just worship you, God, and just be overcome by your presence. God, they'd be overcome by your love and your grace and your mercy um, as they sing out to you this morning, as we get into your word. God, meet with us in this place now. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Let's sing together. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, Church, you can be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. Glad that you're here. And uh, those of you online, we're glad you're with us this morning. And we are so looking forward to today and everything that God has for us. I got. I want to tell you one thing. Uh, last week was Easter, and we celebrated. What did we celebrate? Anybody remember? He's risen. You know what? We're still celebrating that because he's still risen. And uh, every Sunday, it's a celebration. We need to come in here with that attitude of celebration, just like we did last week, you know. And, and I know there was a few more folks here last week, and it was exciting. And there'll still be some more joining us, I'm sure of that. But, but the reality is, is that 
Every week is a celebration and every week is hopeful because the risen Lord is with us and he is in our midst today. And I'm excited about that and I praise him for being here with us today. A couple things I want to remind you of. Youth, tonight we're getting back together starting tonight at 6 o'clock and uh, make sure you're here, bring friends. We have some fun stuff planned. It's going to be good and we're going to learn some things and talk some things. Uh, so listen today and try to hear what I'm saying so maybe you can kind of tie into tonight a little bit. And But let's be here six o'clock and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, May 2nd, Put that on your calendar and everybody plan on being here on May 2nd. May 2nd, we're going to, um, we're going to rededicate the sanctuary, this, this auditorium part with all the new sound and everything that we've done. We're just going to rededicate to the Lord and we're going to have a great time together that day. And, uh, I want you to be here and celebrate that with us. And, uh, we're excited about doing that and looking forward to that. Um, so make sure that you're here for that. Uh, is there anything else I need to mention, anything I can think of? I, don't, I think that was it for me today. But I'm just thankful for all that you're doing uh, and, and for being here and, and for just uh, participating in, in church and, and uh, in worship and in community and all the things that we're doing. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just good to be together, like Ian was saying earlier, Pastor Ian was saying earlier. It's just good. I miss that. And I love... Sunday, not because it's more spiritual or more, uh, we worship Christ more or anything like that. I just, I, I like Sunday because we gather to do it and I like being with you and it's just good to be together. So let's just pray together right now and just lift up, um, uh, lift up the Lord and praise his name today and worship him and all of you online, join us in doing that. And let's just celebrate all that Jesus is doing to get with us. So, Father, today we just give you praise and, and thanksgiving. We give you uh, uh, just all the, all the praise that is possible, Lord, because you are so good to us and so good. You have blessed us with so many things. We're overwhelmed by all that you do for us. Lord, I, I love you today, and I, I just praise you. And I invite your presence right now to just be a part of everything that, that we do. Lord, we don't want to do anything on our own. We don't want to do anything just because it's ours and we like it and it's fun. We want to do everything we do as unto you. We want to bring glory and honor and praise to you. Because Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. You're so good to us. And we celebrate you this morning. Lord, I pray right now that you will be with each person here. Lord, you know where we've been this week. Some of us have walked through some pretty deep waters. Some of us have been in a struggle. Some of us have been on top of the mountain this week, Lord. Wherever we've been this week, Lord, we know that you've been with us. And, and Lord, I pray that today you'll bring us into your presence and remind us of why we have what we have, that we are in your presence, that we, that we are where we're at because of you. You are so good to us. Lord, you know there's some right now who are struggling physically, and we pray for that, Lord. Some called today and said uh, that they didn't feel well. I pray for Donna and pray for uh, Diane Kennedy and, and uh, Diana Kennedy and, and others, Lord, that, that just right now, uh, Lord, are, are just struggling uh, physically. I pray for them. Just touch them. Uh, Lord, I, I, I think I heard that Debbie uh, uh, Gary had surgery, and uh, emergency surgery. I pray for her right now, Lord. I'll just lift her up. Lord, we thank you for her life, and we just ask that you would touch her wherever she's at right this moment. Lord, I just want to ask you to be with uh, all of us, and uh, Lord, just guide this worship. Take over. This is your church, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do want to mention one more thing. Um, there's a, a missionary that has been a part of our church from the time she was in college, I believe, on. And her name was Edna Lochner. And Edna uh, started uh, after she got done and retired from her uh, ministry in Africa. She came back and started Christian Literature for Africa up in Fort Wayne. And she's continued to work well into her uh, probably close to 80, maybe a little more than 80 some years old and just did that. And she passed away yesterday. I think she was 90 something by uh, then and, and she passed away. And I, you know, it's not sad because <laughs> she lived her life for the Lord. And I tell you right now that all of heaven is rejoicing because Edna's home with them. Um, but anyway, I, I wanted to make sure you knew that you might pray for her family. If there's any of them left, I don't even know if she has family left, but, but pray for them if they're, uh, left and, and just thank the God for, for people like Edna Lochner, who, who didn't hold back and didn't say, well, I'm, 
I'm just a single lady. There's nothing I can do. She just did what God wanted her to do, and she just did it well. And we just give praise and thanksgiving for all that God does. So anyway, we just wanted to tell you that. Let's celebrate God together today. Um, you know, last week the, we told you to not let anything get in the way. Now, just cast off all those things that want to get in the way and stop us from doing that. Today, you just got to get rid of all those things. Don't worry about whether somebody's here next to you. Don't worry whether somebody's going to think you're goofy because you kind of dancing a little bit or, or got your hands in the air. If God is with you right now, would you just celebrate him? Would you just rejoice with me? Let's just let God have all the glory, all the praise, and let's join in the band with the band and let's sing together today. Let's stand up and, and let's sing. As we sing this next song, I just, I just hope that you have found that God has been faithful to you this week, that God has been faithful in all the things that you've been going through or have been dealing with, that I had a situation that happened uh, just yesterday, and I won't necessarily share any of the details, but it was a moment where God just confirmed to me that he's in control, that he has got it. He's completely aware of all the little details, and sometimes we don't understand how, why certain things have to happen a certain way or why... You know, people do what they do, but God said, I got it. It's okay. I've been faithful. I'm going to be faithful to you. All my promises are yes and amen, and I'm in control. So let's sing about that this morning.
hear that. That was good and loud. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. morning we're gonna teach you a new song but it's really just a song from scripture and it comes straight out of the verses uh the numbers chapter 6 verses 22 through 27 can you put that up for me eric it says this the lord said to moses tell aaron there we go tell aaron and his sons this is how you are to bless the israelites say to them the lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Amen. This is often what we refer to as, as, as like the blessing, the prayer of blessing. Like, God, you know, may you make your face shine upon us. It's beautiful, beautiful language that we're going to sing together this morning in this song the lord we want god's blessing to wash over us we want god's blessing over us as individuals but also as a church as a faith community as we reach out into the lives of people that we 
that we gather around every day that we work with or that we know or that are in our family and people that are far from Jesus, people that we just maybe see at the grocery. We want God's blessing to just pour onto them and pour out from us. And so may that be true. And may we worship God because of that this morning.
want to feel your presence God, all around us. God, and we want it to carry on and go on for generations. God, we want, we want to be known for a generation saved. Generations found in Jesus' name. Not lost, not lost to the ways of this world or to Satan's schemes, but found in Jesus' name. God, may your favor rest upon us and may we see people come to know you all around. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. You can be seated, church. If the kids would go ahead and come up to be dismissed. These are the generations we were just singing about that need to be, that need to be saved. Man, my heart was just filled when we were singing that. I hope that you heard that song and I hope you received that blessing. You allowed it to become something that was real to you. That wasn't just a song. That truly was a blessing being pronounced over you and given to you. And uh, receive that today. Let that be your blessing from the Lord today. Amen couple things. When we're done today, if you paid for or put an Easter lily in your loved one's name, memory, or honor of, take one home with you. (laughs) We've got plenty. And uh, come get yours. There's some here. The rest are out in the foyer. It was just so much smell in here when I walked in here this week that I couldn't breathe anymore. It was like a greenhouse. It just overwhelmed you. My nose immediately was just, I mean, it was just, wow, you know, it was awful. (laughs) It was awesome, but it was awful. Couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. So get those. Second thing is, if if you would like one of the flowers, the tulips or the others, I can't remember what those are called right now. Um, If you'd like one of those, uh, come up, first come, first serve, take one. Don't take 10. Take one and you can take that home with you as well because they won't be good by this time next week. And that way you can take it home and plant it, and it'll grow back. I've got a couple in my yard now that, uh, that just bloomed that are just beautiful. So uh, make sure you take care of that. Uh, I see some other youth here. Remind you, 6 o'clock tonight, youth, here at the church, having fun. So make sure you're here, and would love to have you be a part with us. That will be, uh, be very special for me, and I'll be there. It'll be great. We're looking forward to that. Uh, Shelly will be there. Uh, we'll have a good time, so make sure you're there. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Luke chapter 24, if you have those with you, or your phone, or however you do that, and I think some of it will be up here on the, on the board as well, but turn to Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 49. We're going to continue on looking at Jesus and the resurrection and, and some of that today, and I want to do that with you. So we're going to read the scripture together, and um, let me... Let me pray and then we'll read. Father, I thank you again for this day. And uh, Lord, we invite you now to speak to our hearts. Would you open your word up right now? Would you make it become real to us so that no matter where we're at here at home, uh, someplace driving where we're listening to it, whatever, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts and that today we would hear Jesus speaking to us and that today we would realize our part And that today we'd be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So starting in verse 13, that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleophas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers 
were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they'd seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. And some of our men ran out to see and sure enough his body was gone just as the women had said. And I want you to notice there, they didn't say surely enough he was alive. They said his body was gone as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe that all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey, and Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it and he gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened And they recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as we talked with us, as he talked with us on the road and explained the scripture to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem where they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Where are your, why, why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me. Make sure I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. And then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. I have learned that the way in which you first encounter something will affect how you see that thing for the rest of your life. It just works that way. For instance, if I go to your house and you make lasagna and I've never had lasagna before and we sit down to eat lasagna and you make really lousy lasagna and I take a bite out of that lasagna and I go, oh, lasagna stinks. I never want to taste lasagna again. And then I invite you to my house and you come over to my house and and, and we go to uh, eat at my house and my wife has made lasagna and she makes the best lasagna in the whole world. She really does. I'm not joking. It's really awesome. And she's made this lasagna and you're going, man, I wish I hadn't come. I would rather be at the dentist getting two teeth pulled without any anesthesia than eat lasagna because your first experience with it was negative and so you're afraid of it for the rest of your life. You're always going to say, oh, lasagna. Your first impression has influenced the rest of your life. Jesus' disciples had been through life with Jesus. They had encountered him as a man. Their first encounter with Jesus was, he's a man, just like any other man. They had seen his power, but they'd seen him as a man. They had seen him die, and they'd seen him die as a man. And they had a belief fed by experience that said, Jesus is a man, He died, we saw it, dead men go into tombs, and you never see them again. Anybody else here has, have have you experienced that in your life? I have. Uh, My first belief about death and, and men is the first significant death in my life was when I was six years old, and I was out riding through the neighborhood, and and having fun with my friends back then, kids, we were allowed to ride through the neighborhood. Mom didn't say much about it, just kind of went and did our thing. And, you know, as long as you're home when she called and you could hear her call over all the other calls going on, because that was your mom, you know. Uh, and I'm out riding in the neighborhood and I hear her calling and I go home as fast as I can go. And, and I get home and she's standing there and she's crying. 
And she told me that my grandpa Gray had had a heart attack. And she said, the neighbor lady's going to take care of you kids. I'm going to the hospital. And she left to go to the hospital and he died. And I never saw him again. I saw him in a casket laid out in front. I experienced the things that you experience at a funeral for the first time. And I haven't seen him since. They buried him on in a, in a cemetery in Alexandria right there on nine. I, I found his grave one day. I went up there and I figured out where he was at. But he's there as far as I know. All of his remains are still there in the ground as far as I know. He did not ever rise from the dead. That's my experience with death. These men had seen Jesus' power, but they had seen him beaten. They'd seen him crucified. They'd seen him pierced with a sword by Roman soldiers. So they had a convincing belief that Jesus had died. And everything he had taught, everything that they believed about Jesus to be true up to that point, everything they had hoped, him being the Messiah who would deliver them, they suddenly came to the conclusion that they were wrong and that Jesus had died and that he was gone. And that's where they were living at that day as they walked along the road to Emmaus. So now these two disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus and they're talking and they're commiserating and they're, they're defeated and they're discouraged and they're, they're, they're in complete question. What in the world do we do now? We thought he was the one. We, we gave up our lives. We were, we were ready to follow him. We were ready to do whatever he asked. We thought he was going to be the one. And in their minds, they, they, they went through everything that had happened in the last four or five days, the ride into Jerusalem, the Passover meal, the cleansing of the temple, the, the cursing of the fig tree, Jesus' arrest, his trial, his flogging, his crucifixion, his death and burial. And now the women who had said, he was not in the tomb and they said they had seen angels who said that Jesus was alive resurrected from the dead and they just they just didn't know what to do so they were talking to each other what well, what do we do what do we do now I mean he's dead and we know what dead looks like and dead doesn't get back up and dead stays dead and there's nothing we can do and as they talked Here's the problem. Number one, they let the circumstances from the past dictate and decide how they saw all these events. And we all do that, right? We let the circumstance from the past dictate every little thing that's going on. We always operate from the past. I, I, listen, I was talking to a guy this week, a, a very wise man, a, a counselor, and he said one of the biggest problems in people's lives is this. That they always talk from history. And as long as you're talking from history, you can't change. Because this is what you believe to be true and you stay with it no matter what. You have to eventually give that up and change that or you can't ever get well. You can't move beyond that. And that's what these guys were doing. Jesus was dead. They saw it. They knew what dead meant. Dead people don't come back to life. They'd heard the rumors. They maybe had heard about Lazarus, maybe even seen Lazarus, but it still didn't register that he was really dead when Jesus called him out of the tomb. They thought maybe he was sick and maybe he was asleep, but dead we know better. Dead is dead and dead doesn't get back up. You stay dead. The idea of a resurrection just simply doesn't make sense to them. They have no grid for resurrection. So they just went on believing Jesus was a good guy, but now he's dead. And and you know, a lot of us have been there. I've been there. You've been there. Sometimes something happens and it just seems too good to be true. I've had a lot of things like that happen in my life. And you try to find a plausible explanation for what took place. Because it just seems too good to be true. And that's what the world is doing when we say Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead. When you and I say that, there's a lot of people who look at you like, well, what's wrong with you? You're, 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 so, you're really that gullible that you believe Jesus rose from the dead? They don't really get what happened that it, when we say that he's risen from the dead. I, I've heard it explained in many different ways. I've heard people try to tell me that Jesus wasn't really dead, that he just got beat up a lot and he was passed out from the pain and they laid him in the tomb and three days later he got to feeling better, got up and moved that rock out of the way and walked out. Well, first of all, let me tell you, that rock was a big rock. He was beat up pretty good. If that's all happened to him and with that much blood loss, he didn't move the rock by himself. I'm just going to just leave it there. You can deal with that any way you want to, but I really am convinced of that. Second one is they told him, well, you know, the disciples, they just didn't want to let it in and they wanted to confirm the belief. So they stole the body. They moved the rock and stole the body. Now we know there were armed guards posted all around it and somehow they must have just, uh, you know, overwhelmed the Roman soldiers. Uh, Yeah. 
And uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, these two men knew what death looked like. They knew what had happened when you die. And the circumstances of death were just too real for them to believe that someone who was actually dead could be resurrected. And to be honest, that's where a lot of Christian people are as well today. The circumstances are just too real. Death is just too final. Disease is just too real. Surely you can't get well that way. Surely God can't overcome that. The disease, I mean, cancer is just too real, right? We've heard that. The problems are just too big. But the problem is that these two are, and we are unaware of who they were. Uh, the, the problem is that these two and we are unaware of who they were following. They didn't really realize who it was that they'd been following all along. That's the problem. A lot of us, we just really don't really understand who it is that we're here to worship. You know? Because I've got to tell you the truth right now. If Sunday school Jesus is who you're worshiping, you're not worshiping the right guy. I love Sunday school Jesus because he's nice and kind. Kind of like Ricky Bobby and, you know, little baby Jesus. You know, it's nice to worship little baby Jesus. Kind. But I think Jesus might be a little more than that. And we need to talk about that. They didn't get yet that Jesus is the one who had created the universes. People are telling me there's universes, not just universe. So he created them all. It wasn't like he spoke one into being and there's another God out there doing it. Jesus spoke all the universes, if there's universes, into being. Everything that's out there, he spoke and it happened. That's the Jesus you're worshiping today. Okay? He's big. He's really big. If he can speak life into this world, if he can speak life into this world, and you say, well, it was a big bang theory. Okay, fine. I have no problem. Big bang theory, however you want it to happen. He spoke and boom, <laughs> it happened. And if he can do that, he can speak life back into a dead body. And he did. The second problem that, this, that these men on the road to Emmaus had was that they knew something about Jesus, but they didn't really know Jesus. Now, you know, that seems ridiculous because maybe they'd been with Jesus through the three years that he had ministered and you would think by then they would have known him. They'd seen miracles. They'd heard his messages. They had an idea that maybe he was the Messiah even, but they didn't have a clue what the Messiah was about. They didn't get what Messiah meant yet. They didn't understand what it was that Jesus had come here to do. They didn't understand that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us, God on earth. They didn't understand. They had encountered God himself. They thought he was about to defeat Rome and there was going to be a physical battle of some sort and, and the political climate was going to change. They had no idea that the whole reason that Jesus had come here to earth was to become the sacrifice for sin, that in the Jewish understanding, he was the Passover lamb, that he was coming to take care of everything so that they could live forever. They didn't get that part. They were spiritually confused. And, and again, I think a lot of people in, are in the same boat these days. We don't really understand what it is that Jesus is about. We've seen some things. We, we've heard some things that we have somehow think Jesus came to make us better people. But they have to understand, and you need to understand, that Jesus did not come to earth to get us to go to church. See, I think a lot of people think that's all Jesus did. He came here so we could go to church and behave ourselves. Jesus didn't come so you can go to church and behave yourself. I know some Christians that don't behave themselves real well, and they're still pretty much on fire for Jesus. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you that, you know, it shouldn't change your life. But if all it does is make you so that you don't cuss a little, or whatever, then you've missed the point. You've missed the point completely. Too many people don't understand. Jesus did not come to earth to make us nice. He didn't come to earth so we would sing hymns or gospel music or the music that we sing up here. I love the music and I love the way it's being done. It's fantastic, but that's not the point of Christianity in any way, shape, or form. He didn't come to earth to make us nice. Jesus came to earth to give us life. Wake up and accept that right now and get excited about it. He came to earth to give you life. He came to give life. He came to give life back to you. He came so that you could begin to do everything that it was that he made you to do. 
came to earth to take back the earth that Satan had stolen. Satan, when he came into uh, to mankind, that earth belonged to Adam. And he tricked Adam and Eve and he told them that they would uh, not die. And, and they believed him. And when they did that, they surrendered the rights of this earth to Satan. And Jesus said, it's my earth and I'm taking it back. And that's what he came to do. Came to die in our place so we can, by his love and grace, be set free of sin. Right now, I don't have to walk around and live in sin. Sin has been defeated. It's not like sin has been kind of squashed down a little bit. It's done. It's finished. It's been ground under his heel. And he came to redeem us from that. He paid the price for our sin completely. There is no sin that you can commit that has not already been paid for. The price of sin was paid in full. It's been marked paid in full. Don't you love it when you go somewhere and you have a ticket that says paid in full and you drive in and you hand it to them and they say, paid in full, okay. And they load your truck and you drive out. You don't have to write a check and you don't have to run a credit card. And that's the way it is. It has been paid in full, stamped. You have the receipt. And Jesus paid the price in full for your sins. And he came to radically redeem and restore people and who are and, and, and fill you up by the power of his resurrection to go out into the world and shake it up. Didn't call you to sit in church week after week, bored out of your mind, saying, well, that was a nice sermon. He called you to have power so that you can go out in the world and be different so that the world can go what in the world those people are different they have power he wants people who will lay aside their lives and love people so radically that they speak truth and love to them no matter what the third thing for these two men is this their hopes and dreams were dashed These poor guys had been a part of what they thought was a great movement. They had believed that God was moving and was going to set his people free from this political bondage. And they thought they were going to be on the inside. And they thought that they were going to be like, you know, high ups in the new kind of government that was going to go on. And now this guy that they believed in, he was dead. And they were struggling with what in the world and why and why did we give in and what in the world was he talking about then? Have you ever been there where you just felt like giving up? Like everything that you believed, everything that you thought was going to happen, everything you dreamed of suddenly gets gone. Man, I've lived that the last 10 years in so many ways. Things that I dreamed, things that I believed was going to happen and it hasn't. And I'm sitting here going, what in the world? And you're left asking why and it leaves you kind of lost and wondering and what do I do next? And I think these guys were just going home for a while to try to figure it all out. Lots of people are pretty lost right now. COVID has left a lot of people going, what in the world do we do now? Because it doesn't look like it did before. I went into Kohl's yesterday. I hadn't been in Kohl's for probably a year. I walked in there. It doesn't look like it used to. Has anybody been there? Half of it's not even there anymore. It's changed. I don't understand it, but it has. And COVID has done a lot of that to a lot of places. It's not the same anymore. I was talking to a lady this week and she kind of works in the automotive industry packaging deal and she was telling us that, 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 they, that a lot of these automotive companies can't get plastics to, to make the parts they need anymore because their plastics are a byproduct of jet fuel and nobody's using jet fuel, fuel so they're not manufacturing and, and refining jet fuel so there's no plastic so they can't make the auto parts. I mean, it's just, what in the world are you going to do? I saw where GM has all their cars sitting there. They've manufactured them, but they can't use them because they don't have the plastic to make the little chip that goes in the car. So there's no chips, so the cars are sitting there. I mean, everything's changed. COVID has really done a number on a lot of stuff, right? We're all, you know, I've got an answer for GM. Just put crate motors, 67 Camaro crate motors, 327s. Put them in all of them. I can work on that and we'll all be good to go again one more time. I'm just, just an idea. I'm throwing it out there. The guys understand what I'm talking about. The girls, it's okay. They'll explain it to you. But everything's changed. And where are things headed? What will it look like in the future? Am I safe? Will it ever be safe again? That's what a lot of us are asking. Will we ever have a day when we're not hearing about the COVID things on news and in conversation? Will there ever be a day when We laugh about the days when COVID hit and we just go, wow, that was crazy, wasn't it? 
See, a lot of us are, are trying to make sense of it. A lot of our hopes and dreams have been dashed and we're left with pieces. And we, we're left like these two men wondering what to do and we're trying to figure it all out now. But here's the good news. The tomb is empty, but let me help you with that just a moment. They'd gone to the tomb. They'd seen it was empty. And I mentioned this when I was reading the scripture. And they seen that it was empty. They had saw that it was empty. They saw an empty tomb. But. Uh, they'd heard the testimony of the women who said they had seen Jesus alive. But. The circumstances were just too overwhelming. It's just too overwhelming. Who really is Jesus? How could this even be possible? And here's the deal. You and I have gone to church and heard the stories of Jesus' resurrection all of our lives. Those of us have been in church since we were little kids, man. You know, I was like four days old, I think, probably when I got taken to church the first time and and probably got in trouble the first day I was there. I've been in trouble in church most of my life. That's why I became a pastor, so I wouldn't get in trouble, but it didn't work. Still get in trouble all the time. But anyway, uh, we've been to Sunday school. And we've heard about the miracles of Jesus. And they all seem like something from a long time ago. And the question is, and then we add, if they were ever real. Because there's that thing that says, I don't know. You know, it doesn't look like that now so much. So we walk along, they walked along in their unbelief. They had knowledge, they'd been in the presence of Jesus. They'd seen the miracles, they'd heard he was alive. But the whole thing was just more than they could believe in and they had faith in. I think they wanted to believe, and I know I want to believe, and I believe that most of you here are saying, yeah, I want to believe in all that. I really do. So they walked along, and they were talking, and then Jesus came up and joined them. And it's funny because they didn't recognize him. Isn't that weird? I mean, I know it says that God fixed it so they couldn't physically, but, but I think there's more to it than that. They didn't recognize him. They didn't get it. It hadn't made an impact in their hearts yet. They didn't recognize him. How many of us have had the same experience where Jesus came up and walked alongside of us and we didn't know it? We didn't recognize him. Jesus is walking through us right now, walking with us right now through all of our struggles and circumstances and oftentimes we don't even realize that it's Jesus who's walking with us. How many times have you been in a real mess and a friend offers you a hand? comes through for you and you go, wow, that was really awesome. And we didn't recognize that that was Jesus offering you the hand. How many times have you been uh, discouraged and someone calls you and they tell you that they care out of the clear blue? It was like, how in the world would they know that? I am struggling like that. And you don't recognize it, but it was Jesus. Too often we just can't see that it's Jesus and so we miss out because the circumstances are just too great and the situation is just too bleak and we've seen our hopes die and the dream seems to be over and our marriage is a mess and our kids aren't listening and the finances are a mess and surely there's not any hope. And most of us don't even have a grid for Jesus actually being alive and visiting with us personally. That was for back then. Now he died. And this idea of him being with us 2,000 plus years later, that just doesn't even compute with most people. They just don't get that. Jesus talks with them and they invite him to stay with them. And he comes in and they sit down to supper and he picks up the bread and he blesses it and breaks the bread. And they recognize him. Their eyes are suddenly opened. God moved And all of a sudden they realize who they're sitting here with and they're seeing Jesus for who he really is. And then he disappears. They're suddenly aware of what had just happened. They They have had an awakening and it all begins to make sense to them. Everything begins to come into place for them. They begin to put the pieces together. Kind of like the end of a puzzle when you're working a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you work and you work and you work and you work and you look at certain things and you think there's no puzzle piece here. And then right at the end you go, oh, and it all makes sense. And the last few pieces are easy. That's when I help. Ask Darcy. That's when I come in and help, man. I am a great puzzle ender. Not so much a puzzle starter.
they have this awakening and it begins to make sense. It comes together. They've experienced this resurrected Jesus and now they believe. See, when you have a face-to-face encounter with the resurrected Jesus, all of your life is going to change. I'm going to tell you that right now. Paul the Apostle, I love him. Such a great example, just a man, a man who had everything in the world going for him. I talked about that last week. Could have been uh, rich, could have lived his life in the lap of luxury and power. Had an encounter with Jesus and everything changed. On the road to Damascus, Jesus met with him and everything changed. And I'm not going to suggest that many of you, maybe most of us, I, I am going to suggest, let me back up and say, I am going to suggest to you that maybe many of you, probably most of you have had an encounter with Jesus and you failed to recognize him or the encounter for what it really was. You just said, what was one of those coincidences? It's just something that happened. For many of us, the idea of a real supernatural encounter with the resurrected Jesus just seems absurd. And I also think that most of us, if we believe encounters with Jesus at all, are waiting for the Jesus who's in the picture back here to materialize. Only that's not real, right? You guys know that, right? That's just a picture. He didn't look like that. He wasn't white, Jewish, white, but not white, white. He was probably had a long nose, maybe a scraggly beard. Probably fairly short because people were short back then. They didn't have all of our food, so he wasn't very fat like we are. Like I am. I shouldn't say we. That's not very nice. Sorry. But we're waiting for him to appear, and he's not coming like that. That's not who Jesus was or is right now. Jesus showed up to the man on the road, to the men on the road to Emmaus as a stranger and became a friend. Jesus usually shows up looking like a friend who gives us a day off to sit with, he gives up a day off to sit with you and to love you. You getting this? Is this starting to sink in at all? Is anybody here awake and listening to this? Because this is really good. I think God gave me this. I'm pretty sure. He shows up looking like a stranger who says a kind word at just the right time when everything in your life feels like it's falling apart. And then someone comes along and says something nice to you and you go, why would they do that? It's just the way Jesus does things. He shows up in a pair of shoes given to you for your kids when you don't have the money and your kids' shoes are messed up. You know, that's really important. I hope you're hearing this. He shows up in the middle of the night when you're awake and the night is closing in on you and the voice reminds you, I'm holding on to you. Relax. Anybody here besides me been there recently? (laughs) Amen. He shows up like a word of encouragement in the card in the mail when you're about to give up and someone sent you a card and you haven't heard from them for like six years and all of a sudden you get a card. And what in the world? How would they know at that moment you needed them and they showed up? Shows up in people who love you when you've just done something entirely unlovable. I'm, I, that's my favorite one because that's what I do a lot of. I, I'm fairly unlovable when I act like a fool and still people love me. He shows up like a counselor who speaks life into your dying marriage in your heart and lets you know that, hey, you're going to be okay. God's good and he's there for you. He shows up as a childless couple who come over a week before Christmas with gifts and Christmas food when you're laid off from your job and you're broke and have nothing for your kids. And if that sounds sort of specific, it's because I lived that one because I was the kid. I was one of the kids, one of five. And my dad was laid off and a couple from the church who didn't have children, who didn't have to do this at all, just knocked on the door one day and said, here, and they had a box of food, a turkey and all the stuff for Christmas and gifts Kind of like secret families before secret families, Al. (laughs) I lived it. We encounter Christ all over the place and we don't even recognize him. Just like these guys. See, Jesus was right there in the midst. They didn't even recognize him because their circumstances said he was dead. And that's what we're struggling with. We're not recognizing him because we say, well, Jesus is in heaven. He's far away if he is alive. But he died. and, and, And we're just struggling with all those things. 
And we don't recognize him because we don't believe he still is really here with us. But i got to give you some good news today. He really is. He is. He is here with us. The Bible says that he is here with us. Really. See, finally our two friends get it here. They, 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 they get it. That they realize who they've been with. They realize they have had an encounter with Jesus. And it says their hearts burned within them. Have you ever had that moment when your heart was burning within you and you realized this was pretty special. Something was going on. That was Jesus. Where tears flowed because you'd been loved and it seemed so overwhelming. You didn't even know what to do with it. But Jesus had showed up. See, these, these two men, when that happened, they didn't wait for the next day. I love it. They just walked seven miles one direction. Maybe they ate a little. I don't know. But they got right back out and they walked seven miles back the other way. Anybody ever walked 14 miles in one day? I know you did, Mary. (laughs) I remember when you did all that. You know, it makes your feet tired, right? When you do that, right? It it just does, right? And, you know, I've, I've run. I ran 13. That's the farthest I ever ran at one time. And, and you know, but but I mean that's a long way. And, and normal people don't just go out and right now. I mean, if I said to you guys, "Oh, we're going on a 14 mile hike," I, I'm not sure too many of you would volunteer. You know, I mean, I I think that you know some of you might say a mile's okay, a couple miles maybe, but 14 miles in one day. And that's what these guys did because they were so excited they didn't think about it. They said, "Well, we got to go back to Jerusalem." So they turned around and they took the hike all the way back to Jerusalem. And by the way, Emmaus is here and Jerusalem's here. Going this way wasn't all that bad, but the other direction was a a bear. Because they had to get back because they had a burning in their hearts. They had just had an encounter with Jesus and had to tell somebody about it. Just had to tell somebody about it. We just saw Jesus. When we finally realized that we've had an encounter with Jesus... Folks, we don't just sit here in the pew and go, well, that's nice. I'm glad we're at church. We tell people about it. It gets us excited. We begin to tell people about it. It's the greatest day of our lives when we realize that that was Jesus who was there. I think too often we never tell anybody because we're afraid they'll laugh. They'll think we're crazy because everybody thinks he was dead. And we think that he doesn't care, but he does. See, All he did was to come and make you, if all he did was to come and make you nice and make you go to church, well, you're not going to tell anybody about that. You're just going to kind of grouchy, get up on Sunday morning, get your clothes on and go to church. But if he died to make you sinless, if he died to make you whole, if he died to restore this brokenness inside of you, if he died to fix all those things that your parents did to you, if he died to to bless you, if he died to turn you into what he made you for, you're going to go tell some people about that when you have that encounter. Because see, when you encounter Jesus now, you become a witness. In fact, you become one of the eyewitnesses. Because said the Bible said that he appeared to 500 at one time, but since then he's been appearing mostly to each person individually one at a time, but he's appeared to millions and millions of people now over the years if they just would open their eyes to it. And now you have a testimony. A lot of people tell me, I don't have a testimony. Have you ever had an encounter with Jesus? Have you ever seen him? Has he ever showed up in the midst of something? Has he ever brought you a pair of shoes when you didn't have them? Has he ever been that stranger who gave you a hug when you needed it? Then you've had an encounter with Jesus. And that's your testimony. That's your testimony. I was lost. He found me. I was alone. He came and walked with me. I was hungry. He fed me. I was angry. And he helped me overcome my situation and love that person. And get this, the lady, the man who told you about Jesus, when you heard that the first time, you probably don't remember it, but those little Sunday school teachers in your classroom, some of them had blue hair, if you're old enough, you know, you remember them? You know, they, 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 were, they were just the most unique people on earth. It's because that's what Jesus looks like. He doesn't look like this. He looks like little ladies with blue hair. That's good, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, I might say that to Dan Bohai. He can maybe get something out of that. You know, that's pretty good. (laughs) 
you know, when you got that kind word when you were discouraged, that was Jesus. The hug in the middle of the horrible situation. Again, that was Jesus. Remember he said go and he gave us his power and his commission. He said go. Remember that? You know, that's in the Bible. He said go. He gave us his commission. He said take my power, take my authority. You know, and we walk around, I got power and authority. That's not what he meant. I, I figured this out this week. What he meant was go love somebody. Go put your arms around somebody. Go write a card to somebody because they need your help. When I put it in your mind, just write it. Send it. Doesn't matter. They need it. I don't know why. Doesn't matter why. Just send it because I told you to. Because see, here's the deal. Here's what he's given you. He's given us, he's given us a call to be little Christs. He's filled us with his presence to be him so that when we go out into the world and we encounter people and we put an arm around them and love them in their middle of their discouragement, they're having an encounter with Jesus. Man, that should be getting some amens. There should be some shouting going on here because that's good stuff right there. When we love on people in the name of Jesus, they're having an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. A lot of times we want to go and tell them, you need to get saved. What's wrong with you? You're cussing, you drink. And that's not. That's an encounter with Satan. What they need is an encounter with Jesus. Someone who will come alongside them and say, you need some help. Let me be that help. Let me lift you up. Let me hold you up. Let me put my arms around you because I'm filled with Jesus. And Jesus is telling me, I need to help you. That's what it looks like to have an encounter with Jesus. You have a witness of the grace of Christ. You have something to share. You have to tell some way. That's your testimony. And when you have an encounter with Jesus, you begin to understand all the miracles and all the teaching. None of it will lead to understanding. I could see, we could see miracle after miracle happen in the church and people go, well, that's nice. It's not until you have an encounter with Jesus, until he meets you and you know that you've seen him, then everything changes. When you have that encounter with him, when you feel his physical arms around you in the person of a stranger, when you feel loved by a couple who, pro who provides for your kids, your eyes are suddenly open and you can suddenly begin to see. That's why stuff like doing what we do with, uh, 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 with uh, Christmas and uh, the different things that we do with shoes and all that, that's why it's so important. Those kids need those shoes, but what's really important is those people need to meet Jesus. And the only way they're going to meet Jesus a lot of times is if people in this church and others like it will get up and go out and do that and they'll walk into there and instead of just hanging out and saying, here's your shoes and walking away, they'll put an arm around them and say, you know what, lady, I know you're hurting right now. You're alone. You don't have anybody to help you and you got three kids, but I'm here. And all of a sudden they've met Jesus and I'm telling you what, that's life changing. That's life changing. I've just seen Jesus and I'll never be the same. So my question is this today, have you experienced or have you had an encounter with Jesus? Have you ever been in that shoe, in those shoes where somebody came alongside you, where Jesus met you, where all of a sudden somebody did something and you felt that, you, you know that you were loved and you know that you were cared for and you had that encounter with Jesus? Because if you've had that, then praise the Lord for you. You have a testimony. And my guess is, is yes, most of us have had that. There's almost all of us right now, if we would go home today and sit down and begin to pray about it and think about it, could start writing out those moments with Jesus and those encounters. And that's what you need to do. You need to sit down and begin to write those down because you know what? You've had those encounters and you didn't recognize it. But now the lights are coming on. The switch is being turned on and you're seeing it. And you need to be well aware of it because it's the stuff that changes your life. You've had an encounter with the living Christ even when you didn't realize it. And my prayer for you today is, is that you'll begin to look at the next Jesus encounter. You'll begin to look for the next Jesus encounter. That you won't just say, well, I had one 50 years ago, and since then I've just gone to church. If that's true in your life right now, I'm not making fun. I am not. But i got to tell you, you need a fresh encounter with Jesus. Man, you do. And they're all around you waiting to happen. They really are. I, I was reading this morning and. Um, in a book and, and this guy was saying that of all the things that happened in Jesus' life, of all the encounters he had with people, only two of them happened in a church type setting. The rest happened out in the world. So get out in the world. You know what? I, I got to tell you the truth. You know, quit sitting around saying, oh, there's nothing for me to do. Go out and love somebody. You know what's funny? is when we go out and we begin to put our arms around somebody and love them, oftentimes Jesus shows up and puts his arm around us. 
<laughs> and we have that encounter while we're giving an encounter. And it's an incredible moment. I love that. So my prayer for you today is that you begin to look for the next Jesus encounter and that you'll not look past it and miss it. Don't look past it. Don't just say, oh, well, that's just one of the, eh, that's a coincidence. I don't believe there's coincidences in the world. I think it's just God moving in his providence and his ways. And I don't understand it all, but I know that he's doing it. And it's awesome. My prayers is that you will be overwhelmed by it. I don't want you going, well, I had a nice encounter with Jesus and everything is good. <laughs> Paul got knocked off his donkey. I'm saying it nice this time. Got knocked off his donkey, laid on the desert, three days in a house, blind, hungry, thirsty, and got up and said, wow, that was amazing, and began to go to work. You know, he could have said, well, that was just an awful bright light out there, you know, and this voice, well, I was delusional, I guess. He could have justified that. There was all kinds of things he could have said, but he didn't. He understood. And that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to just say, oh, that's nice. I want you to get overwhelmed by the encounter with Jesus. I want it to just knock you off of your donkey. I want you to be so on the desert floor for a while. And I want you to just go, wow, I cannot believe how God is moving in my life. I want you to be overwhelmed by it. And then you begin to understand the awesome love that God has for you. Because I think a lot of us are sitting around saying, in theory, I know that God loves me, but we are not living in the reality of that love. And I want to tell you that you can know the reality of God's love. My prayer is that you will get it. That you will get it. Father, right now, I pray for those who are here, those online, that they will encounter you this week. That they will encounter you. That they will have that moment when you speak through a stranger, through a friend, through circumstances, whatever it might be. And that it won't be, well, that's just the way things are. It happens that way. But they will be aware that they are meeting in the flesh, Jesus. And that you are here to help us, to change us, to make us exactly like you made us to be. That you love us beyond measure. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. And we worship you. Lord, right now, just overwhelm us with your presence this week. Overwhelm us, Lord. We need you. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you do that this week? Would you go home? Those of online, those who are here, would you go home? And, and just sit down and write out some of the encounters that you've had with Jesus. Let them begin to change you. Let that happen this week. Love you guys. I will see you next week. And uh, looking forward to a great week this week. Uh, call me if you need me. And uh, online, thank you for being here. We will see you also next week. Lord bless. Don't forget that you can submit prayer requests.